of salvation You chased down my heart Through all of my failure and pride On a hill you created The light of the world Abandoned in darkness to But before we jump into that, I want you to turn around and make this place feel, uh, feel like home. Give some hugs, some high fives. Compliment them on their pastel choice. And then grab a seat. Hey, happy Easter to everybody. How you doing? Good to see you. Man, if uh, you are new to our church, we are one church that meets in multiple locations. So I want to say... 
Hello to each and every one of our campuses that's gathering with us right now. Let's give them a hand. Other campuses joining us. Good to have you. Love you guys. And uh, if uh, this is your first time or the first time in a long time that you have been to church, can I just say we are absolutely thrilled to have you here. And uh, maybe you came today because uh, it's a holiday. It's a good reason. Maybe you came because uh, somebody that you just really like, they just invited you and you wanted to be polite. And you said, yes, sure, I'll come. And and uh, you weren't quite fully sure how this was going to work. Like, I get it. Like, to be a new person in a new place can be a bit of an awkward, maybe even intimidating thing, uh, especially when that new place is a church. And I don't know, maybe you didn't know how it was going to go down when you got here tonight. Like, maybe you didn't know if, like, we were going to card you at the door, you know, make sure you have enough faith before you get in, or we would have a little questionnaire of beliefs before we would allow you to come in. And I just want you to know that that's never the case, that uh, regardless of what you believe about God or wherever you might be on your spiritual journey, whatever has gone on in your past or whatever you're currently walking through, you are always welcome here as you are. In fact, we like to say that this is a safe place for you to belong before you come to believe. And here's why. We believe that God loves you as you are, He receives you as you are, and He cares about you just as you are. But here's the really, really good news. He loves you so much, he refuses to leave you as you are. He isn't going to leave you there. He wants to come alongside you. He wants to walk with you. And uh, man, if you've got doubts and questions and struggles, and if your life is messy, if it's anything like mine, man, where else to, are you going to go to be able to just to kind of ponder some of those things to hopefully meet the God who loves you that much? And uh, I just want to invite you to come back, and uh, I don't know, maybe that's asking a lot for some of you. I'd love for you to come back, and here's what you can expect, all right? I, I, know, I don't like it whenever people waste my time. How many of you are with me? Like, you don't like it when people waste your time. That should be most of us, all right? I don't want to waste your time. And so when I ask you to come back, we're going to be together for about an hour every weekend, and usually we do like a series of talks. It's maybe anywhere from three to six weeks tops, and we'll look at a passage of scripture, or we'll look at a topic, and, and I want to teach it. I want to explain it. Uh, most importantly, I want to apply it, and I want to show you why it matters, and I want you to be able to leave every week saying, hey, regardless of what I currently believe about God or wherever I'm at in my spiritual journey, that was helpful, and that was hopeful. And that's just what I want to give you every week, and so I want to invite you back next weekend. We're going to do a four-part series of messages called Four by Eight, and uh, we're going to just look at my favorite chapter in the New Testament of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, and uh, they're just pull out four foundational truths out of that one chapter, and then in June, we're going to do a series called At the Movies, which uh, Jesus' favorite way to teach was by telling stories, and uh, his stories were called parables, and uh, today, Hollywood is really, really good at telling stories, and so we're going to leverage that to show you that at the heart of every good story is the gospel message. And so, man, I'd love for you to come back to one or both of those series in the coming uh, weeks and months. We'd always love to have you. And uh, if you have a, uh, a Bible right now or maybe a device with a Bible on it, go ahead and get to John chapter 19. Uh, we're going to read verses 38 to 42. If you uh, didn't bring a Bible in with you, but you have a device, you can actually real quickly download our church app, and there's a free Bible on there that you can use and follow along. And uh, as you're turning there, um, several years ago, I had a, a car that I needed to sell, and so I, I posted it in the paper, and there was this uh, gentleman that came over uh, to look at it, and he wanted to test drive it. And so he, uh, I give him the keys, he gets in the driver's seat, I get in the passenger side, and then we take off down the road, which is a little bit awkward because this is a complete stranger, and I've just given the keys to my car, I'm in the passenger seat, and so we're trying to like awkwardly make small talk. And so he says to me, uh, what do you do for a living? Which, if you are me, is always a loaded question. Like, I just never know the kind of response I'm going to get back when I tell you. You should try it sometime. If you're bored and you're on an airplane and somebody says, what do you do? Just tell them you're a pastor, even though it's not true. Just tell them you're a pastor and just sit back and buckle up, all right? It's just a, an amazing time. It's a lot of entertainment. And so I said, I'm a pastor. And he just, without even looking at me, he's just looking straight out the windshield, no expression on his face. He goes, oh. And then he, he asked me this question. He goes, are you sure... You're in the right line of work. <laughs> I love this guy. I said, uh, yes, I think so, but something tells me you don't think so. 
And I said, yeah, I, I think so. And he goes, okay. And he goes, well, I, I, so, so that, I guess that, that means you're a Christian. I'm like, well, yes, that's usually how it works, right? Like one usually comes before the other. Probably don't want to get those reversed. And, and then he said, he said this, great question. He goes, why? I mean, that's a phenomenal question. See, you and I can make decisions and declarations about all kinds of things in life, and we often do, without ever really giving much thought to why. Why are you a Christian? Well, first of all, let me define what we mean by the term Christian, because I'm not going to assume everybody's on the same page with that terminology. Uh, That word, unfortunately, has a lot of baggage associated with it. It's actually never even really found in the New Testament. Uh, The very first Christians, so to speak, weren't necessarily called Christians until years later. They were just called disciples or followers or followers of the way. And and so when I say Christian, like, are you a Christian? I'm not talking about, like, necessarily uh, your religion. I'm not talking about, like, the set of beliefs you have. I'm not talking about the way that you vote. When I talk about are you a Christian, what I mean is, is, is are you a follower of Jesus? And some of you would be like, well, what does that mean? And I would just simply say it means that you trust Jesus, you look to Jesus, you're seeking after Jesus in every area of your life. That's what I mean by Christian, right? And I would say that maybe many of you uh, watching this or listening to this right now, you'd be like, yeah, I can get on board with that. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. Man, fantastic. Why? And I've heard a lot of people be like, well... Like, because, or that's the way I was raised. I hear that one a lot. Or I, I grew up in a Baptist church, or I grew up in a Catholic church, or I think that it's probably right. Or, and I would just simply say, those things might be true. And I'm not even saying those things are wrong. Those responses are wrong. I am saying that those responses aren't strong enough to stand up against the scrutiny of others or the storms of life. you got to come up with a better answer. There may be many of you listening or watching this that would say, no, I'm not, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Christ follower. I'm out on all that. Now, I wouldn't necessarily call myself an atheist. I mean, I believe that there's probably a God or a higher power out there somewhere. I just don't know which religion has the right one. And I've got all kinds of questions, and I've had some maybe bad experiences, and I've just met some weird and mean and judgmental Christians. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm a Christ follower. And I would simply say, okay, man, thank you for your honesty. That's great that you're honest. Can I just simply ask you this question right here? Why? And can you come up with a good reason and can you articulate that reason? And some of you might be able to, but can I just ask you, some of you walked away from what you thought Christianity was maybe as a teenager, and that's fine, that's the story that you kind of had then, or maybe you walked away in your mid-20s or whatever, but, but now you're in a different season of life, and so when was the last time that you actually really thought through the reasons why you walked away, or the reasons why you were not a Christ follower? And some of you might be like, well, I, I used to be a believer, or I used to uh, follow after Jesus, and I would maybe just simply just present to you, like, did you really, or was it what you rejected, what you walked away from, just religion? Because those are very, very different things. Jesus did not come to establish another religion. He didn't come to just uh, set up like a particular belief system for you. He came to have a relationship with you. The very thing that Jesus was doing and currently is doing is he's mediating. He's your advocate between you and a perfect God. So um, there is a restaurant that I have lunch at on a weekly basis. I usually go there with my executive pastor. We'll have kind of like a weekly lunch meeting. And so we've kind of developed some relationships with the waitresses that are there. And and they know who we are. And and we're trying to talk to them, getting to know them. And and, uh, several months ago, we invited one of them who we we were getting to know. We, We invited her to church. And here was her response. She said, oh, man, that's so nice of you. Thank you guys so, so much. And she goes, but I'm not religious. So she thought, well, I've got to be religious in order to go to church. And I looked back at her and I said, uh, I said, fantastic, we're not either. And she looked at me like I had like green skin and was from another planet. She was like, what are you, you're a pastor. Like you should be, you're like at the front of the line of being religious. It's like, no, 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 Jesus didn't come to make you religious. Jesus didn't ask you to necessarily subscribe to a whole list of doctrinal beliefs. Now, I'm not saying doctrinal beliefs are unimportant. I'm just saying that's not where you begin with Jesus. 
Jesus isn't asking you to become a Republican or a Democrat. Jesus isn't asking you to get your act cleaned up. He's not asking you to come up with answers to all of your questions. Jesus isn't asking you to figure out how to work the words blessing and fellowship into all of your conversations. Jesus isn't asking you to act like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons. He's not asking you to, to do any of that. And for some of you, you never heard that before because maybe what you grew up in was a kind of a sort of a rigid, kind of legalistic, religious experience, which is not anything that Jesus comes to represent. So one of the things that I found is that a lot of people get hung up or held back on these two questions right here. It's what keeps them from God. What about and why would? And just think of all the ways that you can actually finish those two questions. Well, what about world suffering? And what about world hunger? And what about cancer? And what about all these things that I just can't fully explain? And then why would? Why would God allow that? And why would this happen? Can I just simply say that those two questions are good questions and all of us ask them regardless of what we believe. But many of these questions are unanswerable. There's a mystery to them. There isn't any worldview. There isn't any belief system, including like kind of like the thing that you just kind of make your own way that gets answers to those questions. Some of these questions, if not most of them, will go to our grave without an answer. It's not enough to keep you from Jesus. So I think the better questions to ask are this, these two right here. Who is and what happened? Who is Jesus? And who did he claim to be? Because he never once claimed to be another good prophet or another good teacher. He never claimed it to, to make a new religion. And then what happened? What happened 2,000 years ago? Because Christianity is not based on a set of doctrinal beliefs. It's based on an event that either it happened or it didn't. And if Jesus isn't who he said he is, and if the event didn't happen, then this can be the last Easter service that you ever go to. Because all of it is false. You shouldn't just be a little bit religious because Jesus was either a fraud or he was crazy. But if he is the son of God, and if he did die on a cross for your sin and my sin and our shame, and if he did walk out of a grave so that we could one day walk out of ours, then actually you should be here more than just Easter. Like this should actually transform your entire life. Because Jesus didn't just claim to be a good guy. He claimed to be the son of God. That's a pretty tall statement. That's either true or it's not. So I want to look at two individuals in John 19 that really were wrestling with questions. I hope I gave you long enough to turn there. If not, I can keep going. <laughs> okay, I'll take that as uh, get to the text. All right, so, so John 19, verses 38 to 42. These two uh, men, they, they're really wrestling. They're, they're hung up on some questions about Jesus, and they're act, they actually go to him with these questions. And I love that because Jesus isn't defensive. Jesus allows it. And we actually don't get any evidence that they ever get their questions answered. And yet we see a pretty remarkable thing happen. We see that they actually go public with their affection and their devotion to Jesus at a really, really interesting time. And so let me just set it up here. Uh, Jesus has just breathed his last on the cross. His lifeless body is hanging there. Verse 38. Afterward, after his, Jesus' death... Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus. Disciple just means follower. So this guy is a secret follower. He's a, an undercover brother. He's a, he's a camo Christian, all right? And here's why, in parentheses. Because he feared the Jewish leaders. Well, okay, that's an understandable reason. So Joseph of Arimathea is a very wealthy man. He was a member of the council, which explains why he was a secret follower of Jesus. He has a lot to lose. And he goes and asks Pilate. Now, Pilate was the guy who oversaw Jesus' crucifixion. They had to get permission from Pilate for that to ever happen. And some of you might know the story. If you don't, that's totally fine. But basically, the people go to Pilate... They demand that Jesus be crucified. Pilate's like, well, you got to give me a reason. We can't just do this just because you want to. And uh, so they argue it. And Pilate is sort of like, I, I, I don't see it. I don't see what this man has done wrong. But they're pressuring him. Pilate uh, understood that another election was coming up. He, didn't, he, was, he was actually fearful of the people's opinion. So he basically just said, all right, I'll give you what you want. But I wash my hands of this. And Joseph goes back to him after Jesus has died. And he asks for permission to take down Jesus' body. Now, what happens next is astounding. 
When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. Now, you and I might read that and be like, what's the big deal? This is a huge deal because that never happened. Um, Romans only crucified two kinds of people. They crucified common thieves. The two men that were crucified on either side of Jesus were thieves. The second kind of person that they crucified was somebody that was a threat to the Roman Empire. And that was the category Jesus fit into. And so they crucified Jesus, and it was basically meant to be a billboard to anyone else to say, don't cross with the Roman government. If you end up getting sideways with us, that will be what will happen to you. And so if you were crucified on a Roman cross, you did not get the dignity of a proper funeral or burial. They would just take your body down off the cross and they would throw your uh, lifeless corpse out onto the garbage dump outside of town where it would rot in the open air. And so Joseph goes to Pilate and he says, would you please give me permission to take Jesus' body down off the cross? And Pilate grants him permission, which indicates to me that deep down inside, Pilate really didn't believe that Jesus had done anything wrong because if he did, he wouldn't have let Joseph take the body. Verse 39. With him came another guy, the second man in this text, Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. You can read that story in John chapter 3. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. So Nicodemus is a member of the Pharisees. He's also a member of the Sanhedrin, which meant that he was like a big dog. And he has a lot to lose as well. And he goes to Jesus Back in John 3 with some significant questions, basically around new birth. He just didn't understand how somebody could be born again. We never, ever see evidence that Nicodemus had answers to his questions. But here we find him coming with Joseph of Arimathea. He's actually, it costs him something significant financially with these expensive myrrh and aloes to help bury the body of Jesus. Verse 40. Following Jewish burial custom... They, the two of them together, wrapped Jesus' body with spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where uh, there was a new tomb never used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. What this means is they were in a rush. It was the Jewish Passover. The sun was going down. You can't do any work for the next couple of days. And so they're like, we got to hurry. We got to get Jesus' body at least wrapped in some kind of spice or linen because it'll begin to decompose over the weekend and stink. We can't have that happening. We got to get him into a tomb. There was a, a garden nearby the crucifixion. There's a tomb there. How do they know that? Because it's Joseph of Arimathea's plot. It's the one that he had purchased for himself. Only wealthy people had those. He's like, well, we'll put him in there. And, and they were rushing. They were, they were trying to get this done quickly. And so uh, typical men, they didn't do the job right. <laughs> because that's why the ladies had to go back on Monday to do the job right that the men should have done in the first place. And that's when they discovered the empty tomb. So that's how all, that all went down. All right. And so they're in a rush. They, they put his body in the, in the tomb. Here's the question that I have. Both of these individuals were fearful of going public in their affection and devotion to Jesus when Jesus was alive. And now that he's dead, that's when they choose to go public with it. Here's another question I have. Why was it Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple, who went to Pilate to ask for permission for Jesus' body, why wasn't it one of Jesus' public disciples like Peter, James, and John? Where were they? Why didn't they ask Pilate for Jesus' body? You would think that they would have stepped up, but they've actually, ironically, all gone into hiding. And it was Joseph and Nicodemus, these guys who we never uh, saw any, we never read any account of their conversion. We never read any account that they, oh, we finally got all our questions answered and everything settled and put to bed. No, 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 but these guys, they choose to go public with Jesus at a time when you wouldn't think that they would. Why? Well, because Jesus is dead. Like, what, you, what we have to understand is nobody then was expecting a resurrection. They weren't all huddled up outside the tomb on Monday going, 10, 9, 8, 7. No, they were all like in hiding. They, they stumbled upon the empty tomb by accident. 
And the ladies had to go back and tell Peter, hey, come and and see this thing. And then they had to run to check it out for themselves. Nobody was expecting it. Joseph and Nicodemus, this would have been the perfect time for them to go, kind of shrug their shoulders and go, well, I guess the whole thing was a sham. Jesus really isn't who he said he was. Jesus, you know, was just, he talked a big game, but he's dead. So why? What would motivate them to go public with their affection and devotion of Jesus? Here's what I think. I think that they, the, both of these individuals had spent time with Jesus without any agenda. And I think that they had looked Jesus in the eye and they had asked their questions and they had seen how real he was with them. And they could see his authenticity. There was something, could I say it this way, there was something believable about Jesus that even in the face of something that they couldn't get their minds wrapped around, they go, we believe this guy. And we don't know how, and we don't know when, but we believe that he's actually going to somehow do what he said he was going to do. That's astounding to me, and it humbles me. Because I wonder if I would have had their faith. And that's what it was. It was faith. Now here's the thing that you and I have going for us today that Joe and Nick didn't have going for them then. We have an empty tomb. I thought somebody might celebrate that. We have an empty tomb. Right? We have a conquering king. We have a risen savior. We, we, there were over 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive. We have that as evidence. And yet for, for many of us, it's still like quite not enough. And I would just simply say that you, your life doesn't get changed because you get answers to your questions. Your life gets changed when you meet a person. The person of Jesus. And that's what he was offering then. And that's what he's offering to us today. Jesus never once asked you to clean up your act or your behavior. He never asked you to believe all the right things. He never asked you to get all your questions answered. He never asked you to become religious in order to be received by him. He says, just come with, come to me right as you are. Baggage and everything. His invitation was and is always personal. And he says, all you need to do is trust me. All you need to do is look to me. All you need to do is follow me. Just just meet me in that place and let me do what I only can. See, it's much, much better to work on a relationship than it is to work on being religious. And many of you are just working on being religious. And that's what you walked away from when you turned 18 and got out of mom and dad's house. Because it was crushing. And you thought you weren't going to have any fun. And you had all these questions and it was legalistic. You walked away from religion. And I don't blame you. I'm inviting you back into a relationship because the differences between those two things are monumental. See, let me define it. Religion is this, acceptance slash love that is based on my effort and my behavior. And that right there is impossible. It's crushing. Let's just say you managed to get a few of them. All that'll lead to is just spiritual arrogance, which just makes other people not want to be around you. And eventually you'll come to find that you can't live up to it. And it'll crush you. See, relationship is this, acceptance slash love that is based on what Jesus has already done for me. And he just simply says, let me open up your heart so that you can accept it, so that you can receive it. Religion is effort that is required for me to feel better about myself. Salvation through grace is effort Jesus has already extended. And he just says, I just want to invite you into that. For many people, I don't, it's astounding to me how many people I meet that say, well, I can't come to church and I can't receive Jesus and I can't get baptized and I can't change my life until I'm 100% convinced. Who told you that? But you don't make other decisions that way, other big monumental decisions in life. You never get 100% certainty on anything before you jump into big major decisions. What ends up happening? Well, things get personal. Or at some point, you just got to, going to do everything that you can to get all the data you can and then you're not going to grow until you move until you take a step so let's just let me just give you a couple of examples how about this question that everybody asks at least once in their life whether the question is yes or no should I get married you'll probably ask that question at some point in your life for some of you you've said no I'm not going to get married I'm going to be a single adult there's nothing wrong with that others of you like yeah I, I, I got married all right well Think about all the doubts and the fears and the questions that come with that one. Well, what if I marry the wrong person? And 
What if I lose my freedom and I'm afraid of commitment and I can't afford it? And other married people I know, that's reason right there. I, I look at them and they don't seem very excited. And, and uh, you know, it's just all these like, questions that kind of like, can, can be crushing. So, so those of you that got married in the room, did it happen because you got all your questions answered? Well, maybe some of them, but not all of them. What happened? No, those questions got smaller because you met a person and things got personal. And you responded to the person instead of getting an answer to your questions. What about this one? Should I take that new job? Some of you are contemplating that one right now. And you're thinking, man, should I make a move to another state? That depends. If it's Arizona, then yes, you get out of this weather. All right, so right, is, 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 is it going to be a fit? I mean, am I going to be able to do it? What if it doesn't work out? Like, are the people that I work with, is it going to be good chemistry? You, you can't possibly get 100% certainty on any of that. No, what happens? It gets personal. And you meet the people and you do the interviews and you think, well, I think I can. And, and so I'm responding to that rather than getting all my questions answered. And that doesn't mean you're lazy about it. It means you answer what you can, but not everything can be answered before you make a decision. How about this one? Uh, for those of you that already have kids, this is an interesting kind of debate slash argument within your marriage. Um, how many kids should we have? And you married somebody and he wants eight and you want one. And so you kind of got to sort all that out, answer the questions and figure out the why. Let's just say you decide on two kids. And then, and then, you know, you end up having like a really, really nice Valentine's date. And number three comes along. What do you do then? You got to give them away? Like, no. Like, you have fears and concerns and can I afford it? And what about? And, but no, you, a person comes. And it's amazing to me. Like, I have four kids. I had my, our first one, I looked at him, and I'm like, there is impossible. Like, I can't love another human being more than that. And then my daughter came along. It's like, whoop. And then uh, like another daughter came along. It's like, whoop. And, uh, and then a fourth one comes along. It just expands. Why? Because I got my fears addressed? No, I still have them. I've got three girls at home, all right? It's, <laughs> it's because it got personal. And that's why Jesus came. That's why God put flesh on to walk among us so that we might have a personal relationship with him. And here's what I'm saying. It's not that your questions aren't important. And it's not that you shouldn't ask them. I'm just saying that some of you, it's keeping you from a God who gave everything for you. And what he's saying is bring your questions with you. Just cross a line, the line of faith, enter into a relationship with me. Well, how much faith should I have? Should I have this much faith? Should I have that much faith? Should I have this much faith? Jesus, one time addressed that, he goes, have you ever seen a mustard seed? And if you haven't, just Google it. It's really small. He goes, that's all you need. Just that amount of faith. That doesn't seem too convincing. He goes, that's enough for me. Just, just the faith of a mustard seed. Cross that line of faith. Bring your questions with you and watch what he does. He'll either answer them over time or they'll get smaller over time. And you'll look back and go, man, I can't believe those questions were keeping me from Jesus. Jesus is way better than my questions. So my... Uh, my wife and I, uh, when we were dating 21 years ago, uh, got to this place in our relationship where we were either going to like kick it into overdrive and get super serious and walk the aisle and get married, or we were going to split up. And I was sort of in the camp of like, let's, let's get married, and which obviously means she was in the camp of, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, that's not a very fun place to be in. And I remember I, I could... I could feel it. I could sense it from her that she was sort of like distancing herself from me a little bit and a little bit cool towards me. And uh, I know that's like astounding to so many of you. You're like, what was she thinking <laughs> by the laughter? Maybe not. So, um, but I remember like I went to her and she, she just let it all spill out, all these questions that she had been keeping to herself. She's like, I, I, I don't know if I'm ready to be married yet. And what about school? And what about money? And I don't know if you're the right one. And what, what if all this like stuff that just came out, just normal stuff. And I just said, man, I don't have any answers to any of that, but I'm really glad you told me. And I'll just kind of give you your space to let you kind of sort through it. Now, here's the thing. It wasn't long after that. Like, I think it just helped her to vo vocalize all that. But within like the next year, we ended up walking the aisle and, and, and saying, I do. If you were to if, ask her, uh, which don't ever do this if you see her admire. But if you were to ask her, like, like hey, like, was, were those questions worth keeping you from from the last 20 years of marriage and the family you've created, she would go, oh, man, no way. She's like, I'm really glad that those questions didn't keep me from moving ahead. Now, 20 years into the marriage, she has a whole different set of questions, <laughs> all right? But the ones that she was wrestling with then, like, it, it, they got, what happened? They either got resolved or they got smaller. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's close. That when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, man, I, I don't doubt that you have questions and issues and concerns. That's why Jesus is so personal. Jesus looks at you with that moistness in his eyes and a smile on his face. And he said, hey, 
just come with me. Man, just come follow me. Man, let, 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 just bring your questions with you. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those, and it doesn't say who believe all the right things, who become religious, who start attending church, who do all these external things. What does it say? Say these three words with me out loud. Who are in? Who are in Christ Jesus? What I've found is that even longtime Christians have such a hard time with that one. Because we keep wanting to divert back to religion. And we keep wanting to divert back to, hey, prove to me or show me or believe all the right things. All that it says here in, eight, in Romans 8.1 is there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. What does that mean? Those who have a relationship with Jesus. Those who are connected to him. Because you can't bring anything to the table. He brings it all. And once you start working on that relationship, rather than work on being religious, then you'll discover the joy that comes with being a Christ follower. And some of those questions may be a mystery until you go to your grave. But they are not worth keeping you from a God who would get every, give everything for you. So what does it practically mean to follow Jesus? Well, let me give you three statements. That, that, that All these statements do is they just show you what it means to follow Jesus. Here's the first one. I trust you. If you could just simply bring yourself to this, like, man, I've got questions and I've got doubts. Of course you've got doubts. Jesus knew you have doubts. That's why he said have faith. What is faith? Trust. Man, I just trust you, Jesus. I trust that you are who you say you are. I trust that you came to fix what is undeniably broken within me and the world. I trust that you are advocating between me and God. I trust that you are my Savior. You're the Son of God. I'll look to you. That's statement number two. I'm going to look to you instead of looking on the internet. I'm going to look to you instead of looking to my own reasoning or feelings. I'm going to look to you in your word. I'm going to look to you throughout my day. I'm going to look to you when I need strength and hope. That's statement number two. Here's the third. I'll join you. I'll join you in bringing hope to others. I'll join you in being part of something much, much bigger than myself. Like that's the work and the mission of the church. I'll, I'll join you in allowing you to change me from the inside out. Listen, don't make this any harder than it needs to be. Following Jesus means saying, I trust you. I'll look to you. I'll join you. And all it requires is the faith of a mustard seed. In Acts chapter 16, we read about this lady named Lydia who gave her life to Jesus. And it was because Paul and Silas explained the gospel message to her. And I love what it says in verse 14. As she listened to us, us as Paul and Silas. Catch this. The Lord opened her heart and she accepted. That's always how it happens. The Lord opened her heart and she accepted. Not once did it say she was convinced. Not once did it say that she went and cleaned herself up. Not once did it say she got answers to her questions. And I'm not saying those things are unimportant and it didn't happen after. I'm just saying for her to come to Jesus, that God opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. And immediately she and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. And then she makes this fascinating statement. She said, if you agree... That I am a true believer in the Lord. In other words, she was probably wrestling with, is it really this easy? Is it really this simple? Like, I didn't have to take a class. I didn't have to, like, you know, go to something. I didn't have to get confirmed. Like, is it really this easy? She said, if you really think I'm a true believer, if you really believe what you just told me, then come and stay in my home. I love the fact that she said that. And maybe some of you today are going, man, is it really this easy? Or should it be this easy? And I would say, man... If it isn't this easy, then none of us stand a chance. Jesus did all the heavy lifting. Let him do it. I've shared this story uh, with our church family around here before, but many of you haven't heard it. And I, I could tell hundreds of these stories, but this one is by far my favorite. Several years ago, I was in the middle of preaching a sermon on a Sunday morning. And contrary to popular belief, I can see all of you. That's fun. I'm going to wear a GoPro sometime just to show you what you look like when you listen to me. All right. Um, <laughs> But halfway through the sermon, uh, I noticed there was a guy that kind of came in in the back and kind of walked in midway through and sat down in the back. And I couldn't help but notice him because he was a big guy. He was a, a Samoan man, a bald head, two gold loop earrings, covered in tattoos. He looked like Mr. Clean, you know, on the cleaning bottle, had come to life. And you couldn't miss him. He sits right down in the back. I'm looking at him, and he crosses his arms. He looks really upset to be there. And... Like, I would try to, like, make a joke, and he wasn't laughing. He was just like, 
And uh, I thought, I'm going to meet that guy. So as soon as I get done preaching, I ran off the stage and a full-blown sprint. I run to the door that I know that it's the door that people leave out of that don't want to talk to the pastor. I know which door it is, all right? I will see you after, okay? So I, I go run to that door, and he's, like, walking out as I get there, and I'm all out of breath, and I'm like, hey, man. I was like, dude, it's good to have you today. And I stuck up my hand out to shake his hand, and he did not extend his hand. And he just kind of looked at me and kind of glared at me, and he just turned and just walked out the door. And I thought, well, that didn't go well. And I'll probably never see him again. Next Sunday, I'm halfway through my sermon. Mr. Clean walks in. Sits down in the back, crosses his arms, doesn't look any happier to be there. So I thought, I'm going to give him some space. And so I just am out in the lobby, and he walks up to me. And he looks at me, and he goes, are you the preacher? <laughs> I go, what tipped you off, Sherlock? Yeah, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> yes, I am. And he goes, I uh, thought so. He's like, uh, hey, man, uh, like, uh, do you pray? I was like, yeah, yeah, I pray. He's like, well, would you be willing to, like, pray for me? I was totally shocked by that. And I was like, yeah, man, absolutely. I was like, what's going on? And he goes, well, me and my girlfriend just broke up. She just moved out of our apartment, and I just put a down payment on a house, and I just found out yesterday that my blankety-blank landlord isn't going to let me out of my apartment lease, and if he doesn't let me out of my apartment lease, then I'm going to be financially in a really difficult spot. And he goes, would you pray that my blankety-blank landlord would let me out of my lease? And I was like, I'd be happy to, all right? I, I go, hey, uh, what's your name? And he goes, what does that matter? I was like, it doesn't, it, it doesn't. All right, just st stand there. I'll pray in this vicinity for the Lord to beam down his Holy Spirit powers upon you. So I started to pray, and I prayed, and I said, God, you know, would you please, you know, do something to let his landlord get him out of his lease? And and I forget what all I said about that situation, but what, while I had him, I, I just kind of snuck one in on him, and I just said, and God, I don't know my new friend's name, and I don't know what he's going through, and I don't know his past, and I don't know where he stands with you, God, but I just pray that before the end of the year that he would come to know that he is loved by you and that he would come to meet your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. And I, I took a big step back because I didn't know if he'd come out swinging, you know, and, and uh, he had, I, I looked at him, and he, he had, he had some mist in his eyes. And I was like, hey, man, you all right? And he's like, man, these stupid allergies are killing me, man. And, you know, <laughs> and he walked out. And next Sunday, same deal, man. He comes in halfway through the sermon, sits down. I can't get a read on him if he's happy or sad. And, and I'm standing out in the lobby. He walks right up to me, no expression on his face. And I'm bracing myself. And he comes right up. And then he gets this huge smile that comes across that big Samoan head of his it is a smile that I would see so many times from that day forward. And he looked at me and he goes, dude, he's like, my landlord let me out of my lease, man. And I was like, man, that's awesome, dude. That's great. And, he, and then he goes, dude, God like listens to you, man. And he goes, I brought a list today. He like, whips it out. He's like, I need you to give me a new girlfriend and I need you to give me a set of hair. And, I mean, he's just like all this like stuff on his list. I was like, dude, slow down, man. And since he was in a good mood, I was like, hey, man, what's your name? He's like, Eli. I was like, Eli, man, it's good to meet you. I'm Aaron. And I said, Eli, do you have plans for lunch today? He's like, no. And I was like, man, you want to join us? And so he did. And, and then a couple weeks later, we invited him over to our home. We just had, Our kids were really, really little then. So he's like sitting around the table. And he's telling us his story about how he grew up in Hawaii in an abusive home. And as soon as he was old enough to get out of there, he was out of there. He joined the military and served in the military for a while. And then he got out and he'd been from bouncing from job to job. And he'd been arrested a couple of times and in and out of multiple broken relationships and had a little bit of Catholic faith from his upbringing. But he'd been running from God for a really long time. And he was broken and he was depressed and he was lonely and, and I said Eli man we'd love to have you back every week and he goes man you just need to know I'm not religious and I don't think God would I'm worthy of it and I said well Eli you know what every single Sunday I need somebody to like pick up some chairs and move them from this side of the room to this side of the room 
I really didn't. I just made it up, right? So that he would come and just pick up chairs and just move it to the other side. I was just looking for any excuse I could find. Like, Eli, just come and just help me set this thing up. And then you can kind of sit there during the service. And he did, man, he did that for weeks and months. And he would just go to lunch with us after church every week. And we would just work on our relationship. And he would hang out with us and go on hiking trips. And I will never forget that Wednesday afternoon when he just showed up in my office unannounced. And he walked in and he slumped down in the chair and he dropped his head and he goes, would you just tell me how to get it? I was like, what are you talking about, man? Get what? He's like, I've been hanging around you guys for like six months. He's like, can you just tell me how to get what you have? Like, you guys are, I know you're not perfect. I've been around you long enough to see that. But man, you're joyful and there just seems to be this strength that's just, I don't know where it comes from. And would you just tell me how to get it? He's like, what do I have to believe? I'll believe it. What do I have to do? I'll do it. Just give me the list. I'll start working on it. And I just go, Eli, look at me, man. You don't have to do anything. It's not based on what you do. It's based on what Jesus did for you. And I had the privilege that day of getting down on my knees with my brother and leading him to Christ. And he just broken and just sobbing, gave his life to Jesus Christ. Just, it's the mess that he was. And then a couple days later, I I got to baptize that brother in a hot tub, which is my favorite kind of baptistry, man. I just love it. And you wanna know where Eli is today and what he's doing? Eli works on the streets of Sacramento, California, reaching out to teenage boys who've have come from abusive backgrounds and he's trying to instill hope and and a future for them because of the love of Jesus. And man, he wears that big old smile across his big bald head all the time. And it's not because of what he is to bring to the table. Listen, Eli was a mess when he came to know Jesus. But as he crossed that line of faith, to see what Jesus has done in his life to grow him has been astounding. See, here's a dangerous prayer for you. I wonder if you'd be willing to pray it this Easter weekend. God, would you just open my heart? God, would you just open my heart so that I might receive it? God, I want to know you more than I want to be right. And some of you wanted to be right more than you wanted to know God. And if you're willing to pray those two dangerous prayers, God will meet you right in that moment. See, there's there's two questions that you just need to respond to to cross that line of faith. Here's the first one. Is Jesus the son of God who died the death that you deserve to die so that you could live the life that you could never earn on your own? The word for that is savior. And if the answer is yes, next question. Because of that, Jesus can be trusted to be your Lord. So will you go where he tells you to go and do what he tells you to do? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, if the answer is yes to both those things, God will open your heart. You accept it. He meets you right there. Then you grow. And the response across all seven conversion accounts in the book of Acts when somebody did that was to be baptized, which is kind of a weird thing. It means to be dunked underwater and come back up. All that it simply means is a cleansing and a new birth. It's amazing to me how many people think that they got to like accomplish some things or get a bunch of faith before they can step into the waters of baptism. Baptistry, baptism was never meant to be that way. Baptism was, was meant to be a starting line, not a finishing line of your faith. It was, you're a spiritual infant when you come out of the waters of baptism. How many of you have ever been in a delivery room where a lady gave birth to a baby with a full-grown beard? That would be so weird. And so when you go into the baptistry, you're a spiritual infant. And, you're just, and, and it's intimidating and it's scary, but God meets you in that moment of incredible courage and incredible vulnerability. And so I want to give you the opportunity. If you said yes to both those questions right where you're sitting, man, you're ready to be baptized. And before your inner attorney can talk you out of it, I just want to ask you to respond to it by stepping out and, and coming down. We've got everything that you need. We've got uh, shorts. We've got shirts. We've even got dry underwear so you don't have to go home in wet undies. I know that's super weird, but... We have it, all right? And we've got dressing rooms and all that and people that would love to just meet with you and talk with you about your decision. Some of you would be like, well, it's super weird to get baptized on Easter weekend. Like, like we're gonna have like dinner afterwards and I've got like really nice clothes on and I didn't come expecting to do this. I can't think of a better time that your spiritual birthday would be on resurrection weekend. Man, that'd be amazing. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Listen to me. You are not your past. You are not that divorce. You are not that abortion. You are not that breakup. You're not that bankruptcy. You're not that DUI. You're not your internet history. You're not not that addiction. 
And some of you would say, Pastor, you just rattled off one or two or three things that have actually been the biggest things that have ever happened in my life because it defined my failure. Look at me. No, it's not. That is not the biggest thing in your life. That's not the biggest thing that's defined your life. The biggest thing that's defined your life is that there is a God who created you and loves you and he sent his son to nail your sin and shame to the cross so that you could face your future with confidence. That's the biggest thing that's ever happened to you. Jesus is a far better savior than you are a sinner. Some of you are pretty good at sinning. Jesus is a way better savior. And so I just want to invite you to come right where you are, right as you are, questions and all, mess and all, because that's Jesus' favorite kind of people to begin a relationship with. The word for it is authentic. Father, I come to you right now and I just pray that your spirit would be in this room, in the rooms of all of our campuses, that you would do a work that only you can. God, I pray that there's a person right now sitting there that is wrestling, they feel uncomfortable, and I pray that you would open their heart and they would have the faith to accept it even if all they can muster is faith of a mustard seed. So we just give the rest of our time to you as a celebration of new life because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago for us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. What I wanna ask at the other campuses, the campus pastors are gonna give you instructions. Here at this campus, we're all gonna stand to our feet and worship. If you would like to be baptized, you can just walk right out of those double doors where the exit sign is that they're opening up. We'd love to meet you and receive you as you are. So would you please stand to your feet as we sing together and let's celebrate.
over here. This is the official end of service, y'all. But the party ain't over, all right? We're gonna keep baptizing. You're more than welcome to stick around. And listen, if you were a guest with us, come back next week. We celebrate like this every single weekend because Jesus is everything. We love you guys. Have an awesome Easter. We'll see you back here next week. Bye-bye.